Hello, everybody. I want you to take your Bibles, please, and turn with me to 2 Kings chapter 18, and we will be using that as the anchor scripture for today's message. Now, before I begin, I want to thank all of you who've been praying for me. I've had some enormous health problems over the last three weeks, and it is only by prayer that I'm with you today. I have a rare bleeder's disease, and twice, almost bled to death. And on another occasion, my heart quit ble beating, and CPR was performed on me, and had it not been for that, I would have died. So I want to thank all of you for praying. And now, I'm in the very, very early stages of beginning treatment that will take two or three months to deal with a very serious form of prostate cancer. Now, I think it's treatable. They tell me that it is, so I'm not worried about it. But it's going to be a, a very serious treatment that's always uh, somewhat compromised because of this bleeder's disease. I hope you will continue to pray for me. And Sun Baptist Church, I can't say enough about them because I'm in Jacksonville, Florida during this time, and they've just really stepped up to the plate, taking care of Marilyn and of me. And I love them. They know that I love them, and they love me, and I know that. And so I want you to take your Bibles and get ready to listen to this message that I've already preached on Sunday morning at Sun Baptist Church. And you should have been there if you could have been there because I'm not going to be able to cover just exactly everything. I'm going to try to do that, and I'll get most of it, if not all of it, that I covered with them. But you're going to miss the question and answer session. Sometimes you can learn more through a question and answer session than you can in an actual sermon. But I want you to take your Bibles and turn with me to 2 Kings chapter 18. Now let me set the stage. I'm preaching today about how the modern American culture is not only deceiving your family and your children and your teenagers and your grandchildren, but they're brainwashing them as well. Your children and your grandchildren, even if they were raised in a very conservative Bible-believing church, will probably in some way be adversely affected by the culture in which we're living. That was so foreign when you and I were children in the 50s and the 60s. It's a different culture. It's a culture that does not have God included in it for the most part because God has been eliminated. We need to think about that. It needs to be upon our hearts because I believe that America is quickly becoming a communist state. I believe that with all of my heart. I'm convinced of it. And we need to warn our kids. We need to tell our kids that these are treacherous days. And the only hope they have for time and for eternity is thus saith the Lord in the Word of God. Let me show you a little passage before we really get to 2 Kings. I just thought of it. But I think it's very apropos for what I'm speaking about today. Would you turn with me to Isaiah chapter 47? Now, I'll give you a minute to find it. Isaiah chapter 47. And I think it's a prophetic word from the Word of God about the days in which we're living, especially for young people and for the family. Now, Isaiah is bringing a prophecy against Babylon, wicked Babylon, and there will be judgment upon Babylon. But that judgment upon Babylon is the same sort of judgment that God is going to bring upon the world at the end time. Because Babylon is a picture of a world without God. So I want us to see this because I believe it's a, what we call a prophecy of double reference. Now what do I mean by that? That's where the prophet of the Old Testament will give us a prophecy that's a few years in the future that those who hear him say it will see it come to pass. But then it's a prophecy of a greater 
event in the future that those standing there won't see. But here is the lesson. If I prophesy something to you in the near future and you live to see it, something extraordinary, something detailed, and you watch it, you behold it, then that means you've got confidence if that prophecy was true, then the greater prophecy that's coming in the future that has been forecast will also be true. And in Isaiah chapter 47, it's one of those prophecies of double reference. It's about Babylon. They will see it fulfilled. But the greater meaning of it, the greater fulfillment of it, will be at the end of the age in which we're living now. Now I want you to look at what the Bible has to say in verse 9 of Isaiah chapter 47. Get your pencil ready. But these two things shall come to thee in a moment in one day, the loss of children and widowhood. They shall come upon thee of their perfection for the multitude of thy sorceries. Now underline that word sorceries. And for the great abundance of thine enchantments. Now underline enchantments. For thou hast trusted in thy wickedness. Thou hast said, none seeth me. Thy wisdom and thy knowledge, underline knowledge, it hath perverted thee. And thou hast said in thine heart, I am and none else beside me. In other words, I can handle the situation. I don't need anybody else. And I certainly don't need God up in heaven if there is a God up in heaven. I don't need God. I don't need people of faith. Why, well, I don't need that old Bible. I am what I am. I need nothing else. Now, I want to show you three things that came under judgment that the people of Babylon thought would carry them through. Number one, I had you to underline the word sorceries. The word sorcery in the Greek means literally in the Greek, the Greek word is pharmakia. We get the word pharmacy from it. P-H-A-R-M-A-K-I-A, -A -A, pharmakia. That's the word in the Greek. We get the word pharmacy. But sorceries means illicit, ungodly, immoral drugs. Can we not see that America is overflowing with drug traffic? Why, you could go probably within a half mile of wherever you are. And if you knew where to look, you could find somebody that would supply drugs for you. And of course, with this great rush of immigration coming across the southern border, illegal immigration, there is also a tidal wave of fentanyl, the most treacherous, the worst of drugs in American society today. I saw on the news the other night that only the drugs that have come in since the first of the year, and we're only just now in the month of March, there's been enough of the fentanyl come across the southern border alone to kill half the people in the state of Arizona. Last year, enough fentanyl came across the southern border to kill half the population of America. Now think of it. Illicit drugs. I doubt that there's a single one listening to me, but that has been touched by a loved one, a friend, a family member that has suffered and suffered greatly as a result of illegal drugs. It's everywhere. But then notice something else. The Bible talks about enchantments. Now what is that? That's pleasure. That's immoral, ungodly, unscriptural pleasure. And it's everywhere. Music today has the most obscene, pornographic, racially charged lines and lyrics that you could possibly ever imagine. Movies are even worse. Why, there was a day back in the 50s a young man could take a young woman on a date, go to virtually any movie theater, and be able to show her a really good, clean, morally clean, upright movie on their date. I dare say you can't do that much anymore. 
you go to any theater, any theater, anywhere in the United States, and if they have 10, 15, or 20 screens showing movies, virtually all of them will be R-rated movies, and virtually all of them will have God's name taken in a profane way. We've gotten so nowadays that people don't really notice that very much when God's name is taken in vain and when it's used as GD. And I won't even say the other word because I would be convicted by the Spirit in my heart if I did say it. But that's everywhere. And the sad part about it is your children that you've raised and you've taught them never to take God's name in vain, never to curse. They hear it in the movies so much and among their friends that maybe the first time they did feel uneasy about it, maybe a bit of conviction of the Holy Spirit, but now they don't even notice it. They don't even think about it. I haven't seen the movie Elvis. I've been told that in that movie, the actor that is playing Elvis Presley uses GD, using God's name in vain, 13 or 14 times. Those that I know that were very close to Elvis have told me because of his Assembly of God background, he never used the name of God in a profane way. I don't know whether that's true or not. They said it was true, and I trust them. But whatever the case may be, our movies are filled with immorality and profanity. The internet is full of it. Smart telephones are full of it. Our world is nothing but a literal cesspool of filth in the entertainment world. Some rock songs use racially charged epithets of minority groups that should never be uttered. Horrible things. There are Musical lyrics in rock songs and hard metal songs that advocate suicide. They advocate the taking of drugs. Now you that love country music that are older, let me say something to you and I want to be just as direct as I can. You have absolutely no right to get onto your young people about their rock music if you're playing your country music in your rooms or in your homes, or in your automobiles. And this is the reason. They are very similar. More similar than you might think. Rock music glorifies premarital sex and drugs. Country music glorifies extramarital sex and alcohol. There is not a lot of difference. So the Bible says here in prophecy, at the end of time, there will be a drug-laden society. There will be a time when pleasure is immoral and is vulgar. But then look in verse 10. For thou hast trusted in thy wickedness. Thou hast said, none seeth me. Thy wisdom and thy knowledge, it hath perverted thee. It's drawn you away from the core values of what's decent and moral, knowledge. That's talking about the academic world. I've spent quite a bit, quite a bit of time in the academic world. And I'm going to tell you now, if you're over the age of 40, the elementary school you attended and the high school you attended doesn't even exist anymore because now God has been eliminated. The reading of the Bible has been eliminated. Now then, it seems in the modern American classroom, we can talk about Muhammad of the Islam faith. Why, we can talk about Buddha. There'll be no problem. We can talk about Marxism and socialism and the evolution of Darwinism. We can talk about the things that would make us shudder to know that our children are hearing. But oh, we can't talk about Jesus Christ. We can't read the Bible in a classroom and we can't pray. The world of knowledge as pictured here is a world that no young person, no child should have to enter. It's a terrible place. I'm not saying that all teachers are that way, and I'm not saying that all schools are that way, but I am saying that even in the best of public schools in America, 
with excellent teachers and many of them Christian teachers. Those Christian teachers know there's a line they better not cross in expressing their Christian faith or they're going to be in trouble. You must also understand that even in the best of schools, public schools, the textbooks are not textbooks from their local communities. Those textbooks have been written and edited by those who have a foreign idea about morality and scripture and living a godly life. They've been created in those places that you and I are very anxious about in terms of our nation. Places where liberalism is the word of the day. The places where George Soros and where Bill Gates are more honored than Billy Graham or some other great Christian leader. The places like New York and Los Angeles and Chicago, there are where the publishing houses are located that provide for the teaching of your children in some little small rural community of Florida or Tennessee or Arkansas. Look at what he says. We're going to have a time at the end of the age when our children are going to be drawn away by a drug-laden society, by pleasure that has gone haywire, and by an education system that is definitely anti-God. Well, where did all of this take root? I think it took root in 1917 with the Bolshevik Revolution. In the Bolshevik Revolution, when communist control took over in old Russia and the czar system was cast out, they said they were for the working man, but they really weren't. They destroyed the working class in Russia. They elevated those in communist leadership, such as themselves. They were sometimes called the Reds. They are the communists originally contrived in the mind and in the efforts and under the control of its first leader, Vladimir Lenin. Lenin said this one time, I think you should hear it. Quote, Give me four years with your children and the seeds I will sow will never be uprooted, unquote. Now I want you to listen to that again. Because what he's saying is, I don't have to have them for a lifetime. I just need your children for four years. May I tell you that increasingly, in the public school systems of America, particularly the high schools and the colleges, that we are seeing more and more and more a move toward communism. We're seeing more of a move to fulfill what he said in that particular quote. We are watching before our very eyes the teachings of Marxism, of socialism, a harsh criticism of capitalism, which has made America great. We are seeing the introduction of anti-God, anti-biblical, and anti-Christ teachings in the public schools of America. Even members of Congress, elected by people who should know better, are pushing for a school system in America that will be totally sterile of the presence of God, the presence of decency, the presence of morality, but an advocacy toward socialism and communism. Let me read that quote again. Lenin, the founder of communism, one of the founders said, give me four years, only four years with your children and the seeds I will sow will never be uprooted, unquote. Are we a communist nation? No, we are not. I do not believe that, but I will tell you this. We're getting closer year after year of leaving the kind of nation that our forefathers left us and becoming the kind of nation that Lenin dreamed of with his communist revolution. But then let's move somewhere else. Let's look for a minute 
at the rise of Nazism in Germany. Now, the German people have always been marked as brilliant people, ingenious people, really, wonderful people, God-fearing people. But what happened? Well, I'll tell you what happened. Hitler began to rise. He was a brilliant figure in terms of oratory and making speeches. But the real man who made Nazism so popular in Germany and turned the German people into a people that aspired the destruction of every Jew on the face of this earth and actually conquering the world. They were turned into that sort of mad society by Hitler. But the one who really did it was an aide to Hitler. His name was Joseph Goebbels. Joseph Goebbels was a brilliant man. Now, he was a brilliant man. Let me tell you what he did. It's very much like what's happening in America today. Joseph Goebbels decided he would provide a radio free to every family that needed one in the nation of Germany. Television had not been invented at the time. Newspapers, well, the newspapers were okay, but many people didn't bother to read the newspapers, similar to today. But he needed to have that oratory, that brilliant speech giving by Adolf Hitler, ringing in the ears of all Germans, the Germans who would never be in the presence of Hitler, the Germans who would never go to a, to a meeting where he would speak and be a part of the crowd. He needed to get the Germans in the rural areas or the outlying towns. So he provided a radio free for every family in Germany. And then he determined to only have one message played on those radios. Now, the people were so glad to have this modern new invention called the radio that they listened to it for their news, both local and national. They loved that radio. That was their entertainment at night. So Hitler was able to spew his ugly Nazi philosophy over that radio. And there was no one allowed by Goebbels to challenge him. There was only one view presented on that radio about religion or philosophy or government or the economy. Anything that was of interest to any reasonable, rational person in Germany, they would only hear one view, and it was always presented so well, so intellectually persuading. It was so interesting, and there was no counter view allowed. Now, why did Goebbels do this? Well, there are three quotes that I want to read to you from Goebbels. He was what I would call Mr. Propaganda in Germany. And by the way, what is propaganda? You probably heard that word. Propaganda is where somebody who has an entirely different idea about life to that that you hold is somehow through the manipulation of words and sentences and ideas to get you to leave the core values that you've always held. And I am telling you, it's happening in America today, just as Goebbels, with his propaganda and his one-way media, did to influence the brilliant and good German people to forsake their core values of loving mankind and to follow a madman like Hitler. But here are the three quotes I want you to hear from Joseph Goebbels, who was the counselor of propaganda to Adolf Hitler. Quote, if I control the media, I will control the people, unquote. Did you hear that? If I control the media, I will control the people. Now, let me ask you a question. Don't you see that happening in America? 
Don't you see it happening in America? The criminal is to be given more pity than the victims of that criminal's crimes. That is constantly before us by the pundits on television and radio and in the newspapers. Those who work hard are taken for granted and those who are too lazy to work choose not to work, should be given everything. I am telling you, we're living in a society that the media is more and more and more becoming anti-religion, anti-Jesus Christ, anti-hard anti work, anti-perseverance, anti-the sweat of the brow, and is becoming a tool of socialism and communism, which promises everything to the common man, but delivers nothing. There's a second quote by Goebbels that he told Hitler. Quote, if you repeat a line, a lie often enough, the people will believe it and you will believe it too. Did you hear that? If you repeat a lie often enough, the people will believe it, and you will believe it too. Now, I think I've seen that in my own lifetime with people I've recognized, some that I've been associated with, that would tell a lie over and over and over again that they themselves knew was a lie. But they were able to convince other people. And ultimately, at the end of the day, they themselves, though they knew it was a lie in the beginning, now they believed it was the truth. But the most famous quote by Goebbels, I want you to listen to it. The most famous quote by Goebbels, the aide to Hitler, was this. Quote, A lie you tell once remains a lie but a lie you tell a thousand times becomes the truth. Did you hear that? Let me say it again. Quote, a lie you tell once remains a lie, but a lie you tell a thousand times becomes the truth. So what are our young people believing? What is it they believe? And what can we do in order to help them stand against this barrage of lies and deceits whose father ultimately spiritually is the devil himself. But what can we do to somehow fortify the courage and the energy and the wherewithal and the will to stand up against it in a world that's gone mad? Well, I think it's found in the story of Hezekiah. Hezekiah was a young man. He became king of Israel he was the son of a wicked king, Ahaz. And in 2 Kings chapter 18, verse 2 are these words. Twenty and five years old was he when he began to reign. So Hezekiah was 25 years old, a young man. And he reigned 20 and nine years in Jerusalem. His mother's name also was Abi, the daughter of Zechariah. Now I want you to put a circle by verse 3. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father David did. In other words, the way you stand up for God against all the propaganda and all the cynicism about God and all the hatred and the mocking of God, we must tell our young people is by doing that which is right in the sight of the Lord. And the way we know to do that which is right is by careful study and living by the Word of God. Now, I want to take one very crucial time in the life of Hezekiah that's mentioned in 2 Kings chapter 18. It's a crucial time. It's a critical time. And there are three things that I'm going to say about this encounter that Hezekiah has with the enemy of God. 
and show you how that same sort of idea is being perpetrated upon the families of the church in America today. I'm talking about the time that Hezekiah, as the king of Jerusalem, suddenly realized that his worst enemy, the Assyrians, under the leadership of their ruthless king, Sennacherib, has Jerusalem completely surrounded. No place to turn, no way to fight, they're surrounded. And you know the story, at least I hope you do. Sennacherib sends his man, Rabshakeh, with a letter that he wants Rabshakeh to read to Hezekiah. So Hezekiah brings the preacher in, Isaiah. Rabshakeh stands outside of the wall. And he begins to read about everything that Sennacherib is going to do to Jerusalem. In fact, many of the people that live inside that wall, the common people, are up on top of the wall. And they're listening to Rabshakeh read this letter. Now, there are three things, as I said, that I want to share with you. That I think you need to understand to understand that there's that same sort of attack that's being made on your family, your children, and your young people. First of all, write this down. Sennacherib, through Rabshakeh in that letter, told the people of Israel, God is not faithful. Now, would you write that down somewhere? God is not faithful. And that's being told to your young people by the entertainment world by the educational system, by the politics. God is not faithful. Simply isn't faithful. Look at verse 19, if you will, please. And the Bible says this, And Rabshakeh said unto them, Speak ye now to Hezekiah, thus saith the great king of Assyria, What confidence is this wherein thou trustest? Would you underline this? Why are you trusting God, he said? What do you get of it? And then he said, thou sayest. In other words, he's talking to the people of Jerusalem and said, what's it getting you to trust God? He's not faithful. But you turn around and say, Rabshakeh says, you turn around and say, why he's God. But those are vain words. I have counsel and strength of war. Now on whom dost thou trust, Rabshakeh says, that thou resistest and rebellest against me. Who are you trusting? You're crazy. That's what the world is saying to your young people. <laughs> your mom and dad are telling you that if you want to have a good life, and if you want to have a successful life, you need to trust God. What's it gotten you so far? You want popularity? You're going to have to forget God. You want to be a success? You're going to have to live by the rules of the world and rules of your career and rules of your business life of the world. Why, if you try to run your life and make money and have a career by the rules of God and that old ugly book and by what your mom and daddy say, you're going to be broke. You're going to be disappointed. You think God's going to take care of you. He's not going to take care of you. What makes you think that God is going to take care of you? God is not faithful. You can't trust him. What's he done for you so far? What has he done for you so far? Think about it. He hasn't done anything for you. Then the second thing that Sennacherib through his man Rabshakeh said to the people of Israel, and is being said to your family and children to brainwash them today. The second thing is this. God will not take care of you, but I will. Now that's being said to your young people. You may not want me to say that, but that's what's being said to them. Oh, you said, but, but my child goes to church every Sunday. Why, they're there every Sunday. Oh, really? How much time do they spend at church per week? Two hours maybe on a Sunday morning. Some churches an hour on Sunday night. Many churches don't even have a 
Sunday night service. Oh, you got a youth service. Maybe on Wednesday night, another hour. But at school, they're there eight hours a day, five days a week. The world has them for 40 hours. And I don't care how good the teacher is, and I don't care how good the classmates are there. There is some way that the filth and the ugliness and the cheating shyster statements of the world will sneak in on your child. Now, I know there are situations where people are forced, they feel, because of finances and are forced because of problems at home to send their kids, especially in the high school and college, to a public school. But I am telling you now, after having spoken in hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them, if you do that, you better be sure that at home they are saturated in the Word of God and that you take them to sit under the preaching of a real man of God. But number one, God is not faithful. Number two, God will not take care of you, but I will. Now that's what Rabshakeh told them. Now I want you to look at verse 22 of 2 Kings 18. But if you say unto me, we trust in the Lord our God. In other words, I, I'm, I, I, your student says, your child says, I'm trusting in the Lord. Is that he whose high places and whose altars Hezekiah hath taken away and has said to Judah and Jerusalem, ye shall worship before this altar in Jerusalem. In other words, okay, your God's done a few good things, taking away some false altars. Yeah, they've done some good things, but what's he done for you? See, that's the way your young people are approached. You keep talking about all the good things that God has done. What has he really done for you? Now, he may have torn down some pagan altars and done some things for other people, but what's he done for you? The world says, I'm willing to help you. I'm willing to help you. Let's go ahead. Verse 23. Now, therefore, I pray thee, Give pledges to my Lord, the king of Assyria, and I will deliver thee. What he says, I will deliver thee 2,000 horses if thou be able on thy part to set riders upon them. The world says through Rabshakeh, look, <laughs> you people of Jerusalem, you're fools. If you want to believe in your God, go ahead and believe in your God. I mean, after all, Hezekiah's torn down some altars, and they say, eh, that's pretty good. But what's, what, what's it done for you? Well, I tell you, if you'll just surrender and do the bidding of Sennacherib, we'll see to it that you have horses, that you'll be able to take care of yourself. We'll supply your needs. We'll handle everything for you. Obviously, your God's not doing a very good job good um, job of it because we're out here getting ready to destroy you. But we're willing to back up and give you a chance. Now look, you don't think your children don't face that? Many Christian children from Christian homes are bullied at school because they try to stand for God. And those bullies and friends of bullies and quote unquote friends of theirs will say to them, well, why don't you quit talking about church so much? Why don't you quit carrying that Bible around with you? Why don't you just be one of us and we'll take care of you? The bullies won't bully you anymore. We'll take care of everything. We'll handle it for you. God's not doing it. Now, if you want to talk about God on Sunday morning, that's fine. Just don't say anything about it here at school and we will take care of you. You just do things our way and things will be more. And here's the thing you need to understand, those of you that are parents and grandparents, things will be better for your child or grandchild at school. If they renounce God, if they turn their backs upon Jehovah God and the Lord Jesus Christ, things will be better for them. And they will succumb to brainwashing. So Rabshakeh said to the people of Israel, 
Why? God's not faithful. He don't really care about you. Number two, God can't take care of you, but we can. And number three, God doesn't have the power to take care of you. Now, if you want to believe in God, that's fine. But God can't take care of you. You, can, you just simply can't do it. So, in verse 28, Rabshakeh stood and cried with a loud voice to the Jews in their language and spake, saying, Hear the word of the great king of Assyria, Sennacherib. Thus saith the king, Let not Hezekiah deceive you, for he shall not be able to deliver you out of his hand. You better quit listening to these old fuddy duddy Christians. That's what he's saying there. Hezekiah is trying to live for God. You better quit listening to them. Because God doesn't have the power to stop what's about to happen to him. You better quit listening to these people. That's old fashioned. May have been a time that God was a great God, but he's not anymore. He doesn't have any power. Quit listening to people of God. Have you noticed that young people suddenly try to figure out a way not to come to church. They, they, when they were children, they loved coming to church. They loved in being in every part of the church activities. But you begin to notice they don't care about it anymore. Verse 30, Neither let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord. So you just tell your parents, I'm just not going to do it. I'm not going to go to church. I'm not going to read the Bible. I'm not going to pray. And you can't make me. Verse 31, Hearken not to Hezekiah. For thus saith the king of Assyria, Make an agreement with me by a present, and come out to me, and then eat ye every man of his own figure. In other words, if you'll come out and show me you really mean business, be a part of what we're doing, I'll see to it that you're taken care of. And then in verse 33, Remember, the third point is God didn't have the power. Hath any of the gods of the nations at all been able to deliver out of the hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods? And he names the countries. Verse 35. Who are they among all the gods of the countries that they have delivered their country out of mine hand that the Lord should deliver Jerusalem out of mine hand? He said, look at all these other countries. Look at all these other countries. They trusted in their God. We defeated them. They don't exist anymore. <laughs> if we can do it to them, we can do it to Jerusalem. Your God doesn't have any power. He has no more power than an idol. Your young people, your children, are being told by the world Look at all these other young people out here. Same age as you are. Look at these over here that tried to live like you. Why, well, they've lost. They're losers. They never had any friends. They were not popular anymore. Nobody asked them to join in any youth activities with them. Nobody cares about them. But now look over here at this group that decided to reject God. Why, they're popular. They get all the good things. They're not just young people that are wet blankets. They may take a drink of liquor here now and then. They may do some things that they shouldn't do. But see, their God's not going to punish them, even if they do some things that at one time they would not do, because there is no God. He can't punish, and He can't bless. You don't have a God. There are school teachers today, professors in colleges, that mock and mistreat and run down the faith of young people. Are you listening to me? They're doing it. I remember when I was a pastor, a family had a young daughter that went off to a university after she got out of high school. The parents came to me and said, we don't even know who our daughter is anymore. She doesn't believe the Bible, doesn't love God. But she's always admired you, Dr. Hunter. Would you mind talking to her? And so she came on a Sunday night 
came up to me after the service. We were standing by the pulpit. And nothing I said made any difference. She didn't believe the Bible. It was nothing more than a history book. No more a holy book than a math book. My old ratty Bible that's ragged. It was on the pulpit. I took it. I opened it down the middle, laid it on the floor, and I said, step on it. She said, what? I said, step on it. Well, I can't do that. That's the Bible. I said, but you said it was no more than any other book. Yeah, but I can't step on it. And there were tears in her eyes because I think she got the message. Even the Spirit of God tells us there is something different about that book. But I am telling you, my heart breaks when I think about the number of high school students and the number of college students that have been mocked by their faith and been teased and ridiculed by teachers and professors that have no business doing that. But they're doing it. But look at the answer to all of this. If you look at 2 Kings chapter 19, the Bible says this, Hezekiah and the preacher Isaiah began to pray. Verse 15, And Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O Lord God of Israel, which dwellest between the cherubims, thou art the God, even thou alone of all the kingdoms of the earth. Thou hast made heaven and earth. Lord, bow down thine ear and hear. Open, Lord, thine eyes and see and hear the words of Sacharib which he has sent him to reproach the living God. Of a truth, Lord, the kings of Assyria have destroyed the nations in their hands and have cast their gods into the fire. And they were no gods, but the work of man's hands, wood and stone. Therefore, they have destroyed them. Now, therefore, O Lord, our God, I beseech thee, save thou us out of his hand, that all the kings of the earth may know that thou art the Lord God, even thee only. That is what we should be making sure is in the heart and mind of every single member of our families. There's only one God, him alone, and he is the only one that can save. We don't have any business trying to somehow discuss religion with those who hate us and hate God. Look at Isaiah or 2 Kings chapter 19 and verse 6. And Isaiah said unto them, Thus shall ye say to your master, Thus saith the Lord, Be not afraid of the words which thou hast heard, which the servants of the king of Assyria blaspheme me. Behold, I will send a blast upon them. And he did. There's one final thing that I want to share with you. We are in troublous times. Your family is under an attack. I don't suppose you've ever heard the name Alice Bailey. Alice Bailey was born in 1880 and died in 1949. She was raised in a conservative Christian home. But she came to the point in her life that she denied the Bible, didn't believe in the blood atonement, wanted nothing to do with it. More or less became a very, very vicious agnostic. Maybe a, not an atheist. An atheist doesn't even believe there's a God. An agnostic believes you have to prove it. But in 1920, listen, she started an organization called Lucifer's Trust. Would you like to know where it's located? In the plaza around the United Nations in New York City. She finally decided to do away with the name Lucifer's Trust because too many Bible-believing Christians associate that with the devil. So even until today, since 1922, it's been known as uh, Lucy's Trust. Now, what is it about this trust? 
It's anti-God. It's anti-Bible. And Alice Bailey, regularly, more than regularly, was presenting a 10-point program to the United Nations because she wanted to see a one-world global government. Listen to this 10-point statement by Alice Bailey that some call the spiritual foundation of the United Nations. Number one, take Bible and prayer out of the public schools. Now, she died in 1949, and the United Nations was already reading this much, much, much before the time that Madeleine Murray O'Hare and the likes of other atheists were able to get it cast from public schools. Number two, reduce parental authority over their children. Are we not seeing that today? Look at the school boards. Many of the school boards almost have a hatred for parent involvement. How would you feel if your boy or your little girl was told by a school counselor they should be of a different gender but never say anything to you about that? That's happening all across America. Reduce parental authority. Number three, destroy the Judeo-Christian home. The Judeo-Christian home has a mother and a father and children. Number four, open and legalize abortion clinics across America. Number five, destroy the concept of marriage. Number six, accept homosexuality. Number seven, debase art. Now, what does that mean? Art should be ugly. It should be should not be ugly. It should be beautiful and encouraging. But listen to the most popular music and art form. I've already mentioned country music and hard rock music, but that applies to all music and the movies and the books that are written and the sculpture that's created. Debase art. Number eight. Use the media to change minds. I need not say more about that. Number nine, merge all of the Christian denominations into one. And number 10, the government should make laws enforcing these other nine principles I've just read. And the church should gladly endorse these nine. And unfortunately, that's happening too. We're under attack. Our only hope is this book. And the courage and the backbone of all of us to stand up against the wickedness of this world. Will people hate us? Yes. There are preachers who hate me because they think I'm mean-spirited when I preach the truth. There are churches in which I'll never be invited to preach. I've had every kind of attack in my lifetime that you can possibly imagine, most of the time from religious people. We better learn something. We're in a boat that has a hole in it, and the boat is sinking. Somebody better stand up. Somebody say, enough is enough. You may not be able to change your county or your city. You may not be able to change your country. But you can change your home. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. What about you?